It's good to do those kind of service opportunities, aren't they? I, I just commend you. That's wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's take our Bibles and, and uh, open them to Joshua chapter 6. I want to read the first two verses, and then I want to read the, the story as it repeats itself over in verse number 15 through verse 20. You got that, Steve? Can you get that up there for us? Steve does a good job. First two verses, and then 15 through verse, verse number uh, 20. It says here in the Word of God, Now Jericho, get the image here as you read. I want you to, I want you to get the image. Jericho was tightly shut up, you know, sealed, in other words, protected. Remember we talked about the walls of protection? But she was, she was shut up out of fear of the Israelites. It says here that no one went out and no one came in in this, this walled, walled city. Then the Lord, verse number 2, the Lord's speaking here, then the Lord said to Joshua, I want you to see, see what I have done. I have delivered Jericho into your hands, he said, along with its king and its fighting men. If that's the case, what do you have to fear, right? If the leader is destroyed and all the fighting men are destroyed, nothing is for you to fear. Now over to verse 15. Here's the account. Here's what took place. On the seventh day... Scripture says, they got up when? Daybreak. You ever ask yourself why? They had a big event planned, right? God had something big to accomplish, and, and, and he wanted them to, to be able to fulfill this in this time frame. Okay? They got up at daybreak, and they marched around the city. We know the story. Seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city Seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people to do what? Shout, yell, for the Lord has given you the city. The Lord is the one that has given you the city, okay? The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, remember the story of Rahab a few weeks ago? Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. Verse 18. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. In other words, don't, don't uh, take any spoils with you. Okay, None of those things are, are of any value to you. You have the Lord. You don't need uh, imitations. Okay? Okay? Otherwise, he says, the Lord's still speaking, otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and you will bring trouble on it if you, do, if you disobey. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and they must go into his treasure. Verse 20. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted and all the sound of the trumpet and at and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, wouldn't you like to have been there? The wall collapsed so that every man charged straight in, and they took the city. It was a victory I wrote here in my notes that some people today deny could never have happened that way. You know. Such a strong city. How could it fall by men just simply walking around it, right? But as followers of Christ, we know something. Nothing is impossible with our what? With our Lord. Nothing. And even though His plans might not appear to be Good military plans. They work. Okay? Seven times on the seventh day, we read. 
the children of Israel, they walked around the city. Didn't say they had any swords drawn, you see. They just walked around the city. Then those seven priests, I got this picture of it, walking before the ark, they sounded forth the trumpet. And the people were told to join in this celebration. And they yelled. And those massive walls didn't fall out. Had they fallen out, the Israelites would have been injured. But they fell in. And the Israelites were able to use what were the obstacles merely as stepping stones to get in to take the city that God had given to them. It was truly a victory in spite of the fact that some say it never happened. Yeah, I studied this passage of Scripture and I came up with two, two valuable points that stuck out to me as we think about living our Christian life. The first is a form of a question. Who's in control? Are we in control of our lives or is God in control of our lives? Now Joshua was given the leadership and we know that taking that very first step to lead the children of Israel across that swollen, swollen Jordan River was the opening victory for the children of Israel. But as you read these 24 chapters, you will find that there are countless lessons that Joshua learned and we can learn that will enhance our uh, Christian walk. You know, some people have said, when does the Christian life begin? When does your Christian walk, when does your Christian life begin? You ever ask yourself that question? When you prayed the, and Jesus told Nicodemus you had a what? Second birth, you see, a spiritual birth. That's the beginning, perhaps, that's the first step of your Christian walk. But I want something down here, and I want you to think about it. There's more to the Christian walk than just baby steps, right? More to it than just taking baby steps. Sometimes we've got to be willing to take a bigger step than we even think is possible. Because those big steps have a tendency really to stretch our faith, do they not? Think about this. If we never had any pain or any sickness, we would never have to go see a doctor, right? If you never had any pain, never had any sickness, you'd never have to go see a doctor. But because we have those things, we proceed to go. Well, because we have spiritual challenges and spiritual battles, we need to realize that we need to seek our Heavenly Father or seek the Lord Jesus Christ or ask the Holy Spirit to help us. So, I jotted this thought down. Living this successful, abundant life that God promised us in the Gospel of John isn't always going to be easy. Because one of the biggest things in winning a battle is in the planning stage. If you don't plan, nothing good's going to come, right? Now think about this thought of planning. When I have celebration services, that's what I call funerals now. I don't call them funerals anymore because uh, we're, not, we're not there talking to the dead. We're there celebrating the life that that person lived and the influence that he had up on us. Well, when we have those celebration services, I usually tie into my lesson that great promise that Jesus made in John chapter 14, in which he said, I'm going to leave earth 
and I'm going to heaven, and when I get to heaven, I'm going to, this is Jim Dickey paraphrase, Betty, okay? I'm going to prepare a what? A place for you. Now think about this. Jesus has been up there now a little over 2,000 years. Can you just imagine what this place is going to be like? Can you just begin to imagine? I've said this a hundred times, so I'm going to say it a hundred and one. It's got to be everything this book said it was and even more, because here's the reason. Nobody that's up there is trying to leave to get back here. Nobody's trying to leave. There's only one person that left heaven, and that was, that was Jesus. We know last week that while, Jesus, while Joshua was, was walking along and he was plotting his strategy, Joshua encountered a man. And the man had a sword. Remember we talked about this in, John, in Joshua chapter 5. And I said that that man was Jesus B.C. That was Jesus before the birth of Jesus. And this man told, Jesus, told Joshua tonight's lesson. Let's look at again verse number 1 and verse 2 of Joshua chapter 6. I think this is, this is a great part of the whole book of Joshua. If you get this, then you get the book of Joshua. It says, Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went in, no one went out. No one came in. No one went out, excuse me, no one came in. Then the Lord, verse 2, said to Joshua, I want you to see something, Joshua. I want you to see something, church, tonight. I have delivered your Jerichos into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Most important point I want to make tonight if you want to have victory over your Jerichos, here's what you got to do. You got to be on the Lord's side. You got to be on the Lord's side to have victory. Never forget who is in control of all of our life's battles. And really, our life's battles are not physical. We can, we can do something about them. But our life's battles are really spiritual. Because they are spiritual, we have to have spiritual uh, weapons. So I jotted down the three big spiritual weapons that we have. Worship, that's one. We're stronger together than we are by ourselves, right? Okay. The Bible. God's Word is alive. God's Word is ointment. God's Word, as we memorize it and as we learn it, will be used to defeat our number one enemy, being the devil. See, The more we saturate ourselves with God's Word, the more powerful we will be. Because, you see... God, uh, the devil and his demons, they don't really want to attack us when we got our noses in the book. What was it that Jesus used in his defense in the wilderness when Satan tempted him to turn the rock into bread? God's word. He used the scripture, you see. So that's the second of the big three. Worship, God's word, and here's, you guys sang about it tonight, prayer. Prayer. See, When we're Talking with our Heavenly Father, you see, we're on the, we, we, we've got a powerful uh, piece of weaponry that, that keeps the enemy at bay. And I wrote this down. Understanding that God is in control is extremely vital if we're going to experience victory in our Christian lives. Unless you are on God's side, Nothing else matters in the spiritual life. I wrote this down. 
Many times I have made a request for God to be with me. Have you done that? Sure you have. I've asked God to be with me. But maybe I ought to be requesting if I can be with you, God. Is there a difference? Is there a difference? We ask to be with, we ask God uh, to be with us. But is there a difference? Maybe we should be requesting, I want to be with you, God, you see, in this whatever it, 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 it might be, okay? You see, living with God may involve some, some storms. It certainly did as you read the gospel accounts, right? The disciples found themselves, even though they were close associates of the Lord Jesus Christ, several times in big storms, so much so that they even feared for their own lives. See, it may lead me to a difficult mountain or a big challenge. But where God is, is where I want to be. And here's the reason. Where God is, is where I want to be, because where God is, is where the victory is. Where God is, is where the victory is. Used to be a song that we sang. I should have asked Ruthie about it, but I didn't. Last night when I was working through this and putting some more notes together, but when we were in uh, uh, VBS, we used to sing this song, Dare to be a, Dare to be a Daniel. Daniel. You ever thought about the life that Daniel lived and what obstacles that God thrust before him or allowed to happen to him? And as a result of him linking up with God, wow, mighty things happened in the life of Daniel. Great, great prophet of what, 12 chapters? Some tremendous things happened in that, in that man's life. So, we need to ask ourselves, if we want to have victory, who's in control? Okay, there's a second thought. Doing it God's way always brings positive results. Doing it God's way always brings positive results, does it not? We sing a song, there's victory in Jesus. I was thinking about that this week. To live in victory means that you're living with Jesus because there's victory in Jesus, right? To live in victory means that you're choosing to live with Jesus. To live with Jesus means that we're going to live as He directs our lives. Now, God doesn't always direct like we might think. <laughs> How many battles, plans involve walking around a city, carrying a big box, and blowing trumpets and then finally telling the people to yell. How many victories come that way? Well, 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 4 says these words. 1 John 5 and verse 4. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Even our faith. So I ask myself a question. How much faith, Jim, does it take to do it God's way? You ever ask that question, Betty? How much faith does it take to do it God's way? Well, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 30 says these words. By faith, those massive walls of Jericho fell after the people had walked around them for seven days. By faith, you see. It wasn't, it wasn't any, it wasn't any uh, 
military strategy or military might that enabled them to gain this great victory at Jericho. It was simply faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says this, without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then Paul says this. If you look up the word faith, you find these verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7, Paul says this, speaking to the church at Corinth, speaking to us tonight at TBC, we live by faith, not by sight. See, Even though sometimes we would like to See, there's a greater blessing in living by faith than there is by by sight. I wrote this down. If you are going to live in victory, Jim, it will require you to walk in the pathway of faith. Do you believe that? If you're going to live in victory, then it's going to require you to walk in the pathway of faith. And that walking in the pathway of faith requires something. It requires us being willing to humbly submit ourselves before God. When you humbly submit yourself before God, guess what action God does? Now think about this. Get the image. If you're humbling yourself before God, then you're probably not standing upright, but you're probably down on your knees or you're, you're, you, you know, you're bent over. What does God do? He lifts you up. When God lifts you up, does he ever disappoint you? He's never disappointed me. As a UN, never disappointed me. And the beautiful thing when God lifts us up, We never have to be worried or afraid that he's going to let us fall. See, think about that. Sometimes I don't want or like the humbling part. I just want God to pick me up and do it quickly, God, quickly. But think about it. If you had been there, in this Jericho account. And Joshua said to the commanders, to the priests, this is God's strategy. After about the middle of the week, might you have thought that maybe Joshua didn't hear God right? Have you ever felt that way? You know, it's not going as I had uh, sort of perceived or I had planned God, you know. But God keeps reminding me to, you know, wait. That's not easy, but but wait. Here's something else that I thought about this week. Our victorious life must be based upon doing the will of the Father and not ours. As we prepare ourselves for Lent and for the resurrection, Good Friday, Saturday, Resurrection Sunday. Read through those gospel accounts. When Jesus was in that garden, we call the Garden of Gethsemane, remember what he said in part of his prayer? Not my will, but thy will be done. Does God's way always make sense? No, no. In fact, 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and verse number 18 concerning the cross. It is to some foolishness, the cross is. But to us who are saved, what does the cross represent? It represents the power of, of Almighty God that crossed us. Remember I told you 
love isn't a diamond. Love is a cross. That's the real image of love. That cross represents tremendous power of God. So I jotted down here. I don't have to always understand God's will to be victorious. But I have to do this. I have to choose to, to accept it by faith. That means taking what you've learned from the Bible and then putting it into action. In other words, get up, get to work, start going God's direction instead of your own. You know what? The outcome will be amazing. Because we're going to gain the victory. I like what Paul told Timothy. In, in the 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 8, he said, to be a winner, it requires that you fight the good fight. And you finish the course that's set before you. And you keep the faith. Then the Lord will give you one of his crowns the crown of righteousness. Have you ever asked yourself, what are we going to do with those crowns when we get to heaven? Well, I don't think we're going to wear them as trophies. Really, here's what I think we're going to do. I think we're going to be so, so blessed to be there and, and so overwhelmed with the beauty of Christ that we're going to take those crowns that he gives us and we're going to lay them at his wonderful feet. Because in heaven, there will not need to be any, any list of priority. We'll all be on the same level ground. Here's something I wrote down last night. I thought I had my lesson done. Many people fail to see answers to their prayers. That's me. Here's the reason. Because they stop one round short of their conquest of their personal Jericho. Think about it, my friends. On that seventh day, if they had only done it six times instead of seven, saying, this isn't making any sense. I'm tired. Would the outcome been the same? I don't think so. I don't think so. The walls of Jericho came down because of complete obedience. Living in victory means you don't quit this side of heaven. Not always easy. Sometimes it's quite painful. We've heard the little saying that the body men use, no pain, no. Well, think about that. No pain on this earth, no gain where? In heaven. See, think about that. Think about that. John wrote, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So here's my wrap-up. Those very walls that kept the Israelites out became the stepping stones on which they could climb into the city. Here's a great promise. It all happened because of a great shaking, the great God. A great shaking is coming for our world also. Our Joshua, his name is Jesus. He's going to give a signal one day and the trumpet will blast. And then Jesus will reclaim every spoil and he'll defeat every demon and he will do again what he once did at Jericho. Wouldn't it be awesome? I don't want to miss it. 
Wouldn't it be awesome if we show up here in six weeks for what we put on our calendar as sunrise service, a little bit different than normal service? And in the middle of our singing or in the middle of our celebration, we hear the what? The trumpet. Wow. Won't that be something? But until this happens, here's, here's my advice. Here's God's advice. Keep walking. Keep believing. And remember, our spiritual weapons are the three big. Worship. Coming together, we're stronger together than we are by ourselves. God's Word. Oh, we need to hide it in our hearts. We taught the children. Hide it in your heart that you'll not sin against God. Hide it in our hearts. And prayer. God's Word says you have not because you don't have faith. Asking in faith, you see. Then it will only be a matter of time for that Jericho to come down. And I just want to add this little, last little thought. I put this down in my notes this evening before I come over here. It said that when the trumpet sounded, the people, what? Shouted. When we hear that trumpet, don't you think the people that are present and here are going to give the biggest cheer that any spectator has ever given for their favorite team. Amen? Father God, we thank you for the goodness of your word. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that lives within us and guides us. Help us not to quench his leading, that we might be obedient, and we might see what you want us to see that you put in our path. Help us, Father, to always be conscious of looking out for opportunities that we might be able to share to others the magnificent love that you have for the world. Grant to us safety, if it be your will, as we travel back to our homes. Help us as we enter into this first full week of the Lenten season to prepare our, our hearts for this great celebration that the world really knows nothing about and they cannot take it from us, and that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we don't have early shopping on Easter. Amen? <laughs> the, the, those merchants, they haven't been able to capitalize on our true Christian holiday. And I don't think God's going to allow them because it's very, it's very, very, very important. So I don't know about you, sunrise service, I can't forget my jacket and my tie. I want to look my best <laughs> because Jesus might call, right? I'm going to have a suit jacket, but... Buttons are different. <laughs> <laughs>